Question 1 says the daily mean air temperatures from the large data set X degrees centigrade for the month of June 2015 in Jacksonville are summarized in the table below. Part A says use your calculator to estimate the mean and standard deviation of the daily mean air temperatures from the large data set for the month of June 2015 in Jacksonville. Give each of your answers to three significant figures. Because this table is containing the data they're asking us to look at, what this question is essentially asking you is to find the mean and standard deviation of this frequency table. And you can do that using a calculator. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, in input the data into the calculator. That's the first thing you'll have to do if you use this method. So the way you do that is on your calculator, you need to find the stat menu. All calculators are slightly different on mine. It comes up with this menu and I need to go to edit, meaning edit lists. So once you go into this, it should give you a screen looking similar to this where you have L1, L2 standing for list one, list two, and you can input the data into those lists. So the first list is going to be the mean temperatures. Now, of course, we're looking at continuous data, which means we have ranges of values or temperatures. If you have continuous data, you need to put the midpoints of each class interval. So from 22 to 24, the midpoint there is 23. Uh, and then do each one. So 24 to 25 is 24.5, 25 to 26, 25.5. You get the idea. So put the midpoints in. And then your next list is the frequencies. Okay, once you have input all of that data into list one, list two, you then want to go back to the stats menu and then go across to calc. Again, your calculator may look different, but there should be some kind of statistics and then calculations menu in that similar order. We want one var stats standing for one variable statistic. This is not a scatter plot. In other words, you'll have a independent variable, the temperature, and then the dependent variable, the frequency. That's one var, one variable. So go into that. That'll appear on your screen. Then you want to put list one and list two meaning that the, that's the data that you're going to be using. Enter and it'll give you the statistics. Then you need to know that X bar is the mean and sigma X is the standard deviation for this sample. Okay, so then all we need to do is write those down. Now you can use the formula for these, um, but on the mark scheme, you get the mark for the answer and that is all. You don't get any marks for the working out. I'll show you that in a second. So let's just write these down. The mean was 26.6 and the standard deviation, we had to round these off. I think it said give it to three significant figures. So 26.6 is to three significant figures and then uh, we had 2.087 that eight, we're going to have to round up to a nine. So this is going to be 2.09 for the standard deviation. And let's just bring up the, the mark scheme. So I'll just show part A in case you didn't want to see the answers for the rest yet. Um, so here we have the answers 26.6 and 2.09 and B1 is an accuracy mark, meaning you get that one mark. If you get the answer correct, you're not getting marked for any of the working out. So um, M1, I think, is the working. If we just go back, yep, so M is method marks, B is marks are unconditional accuracy marks, independent of any method marks. So as long as you get the answer correct there, then you get those two marks. Part B says the mean and standard deviation for the daily mean air temperatures from the large data set for Perth in June 2015 are 14.8 degrees and 2.37 degrees respectively. The minimum daily mean air temperature in Perth in June 2015 was 8.8 and the maximum daily mean air temperature was 18.5. Use limits for outliers of mean subtract three times the standard deviation and mean plus three times the standard deviation. Show that there are no outliers in the data for Perth in June 2015. Going back to the question again, the mean was 14.8. 2.37 was the standard deviation. So let's go ahead and use the limits they've given us and see if these minimum and maximum are within those limits. So 14.8, uh, 
Okay, so for part B, we've got 14.8. Subtract three times the standard deviation, which was 2.37. Let's see what that is. Okay, let's clear that off. 14, 14.8 subtract three times 2.37. 7.69 and then we need to add that on as well let's see what we get there we can just do entry and then change that to a an addition we get 21.91 okay the min and max again just to remind ourselves is 8.8 .8 and 18.5 they are within those so typically we would say an outlier is outside of that minimum there 7.69 or 21.91 both our min and max are within those limits so therefore we can say there are no outliers in this data it's probably a good idea to finish off with a statement there so something like this both extremes are within three standard deviations of the mean therefore should not be classified as outliers. so just a short statement to summarize your calculations on to part C, so C part one says, assuming each location is typical of the hemisphere it is in, suggest what these means and standard deviations imply about the relative daily mean air temperature in June 2015 in each hemisphere. Give reasons for your answers. That is quite a big assumption. So assuming each location is typical of the hemisphere it is in. A big assumption, but they're asking us to make that assumption, so Let's assume then that, uh, well, you should know that Perth is in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia and Jacksonville is in America, so the Northern Hemisphere. We're assuming that they're representing each one. So Jacksonville would be 26 and roughly 2, 26 and 2 for the mean and standard deviation for the Northern Hemisphere. And then Perth is about 15 and 2 again for the Southern Hemisphere. The southern hemisphere then has a lower daily mean and the northern hemisphere has a highly da higher daily mean. And I would say the standard deviations are fairly similar. Um, not too, um, nothing really significant there. 2.37 versus 2.09. So let's go ahead and write down some of this. The first thing I might do is just to write down uh, the actual measurements. So I would write those down just so you can really clearly see and compare them and then which hemisphere each one belongs to. And then I would write my summary that I just went through. So we're talking about the daily mean temperature. So something like the daily mean temperature is higher in the northern hemisphere in June 2015. There are similar levels of variation in daily temps comparing north and south hemispheres. I don't really know how to shorten that i feel like i could have said that in in much fewer words but anyways that would be my general answer there uh, my suggestion here would be to make a comment on both the means and the standard deviations so i've said that the mean is higher in northern hemisphere and then the standard deviations are similar so make a comment on both measurements to get those two marks and then going back to the question again part two says comment on the validity of the assumption in part one and again well we already said that that assumption is a really big assumption assuming each location is typical of the hemisphere it is in that's just not right is it you can't just take the measurements from one city and then say okay the whole hemisphere is like that one city um, so i would say something like you know it, the temperatures are likely to vary across the whole hemisphere okay so let's go ahead and write that down for part two i would say not valid not valid as temperatures are likely to vary across the hemispheres and one location should not be used to make assumptions about the entire hemisphere okay that was part c part d says amy models the daily mean air temperature in summer in jacksonville by uh, the normal distribution with mean 27 and standard deviation of 2.1 that's what that notation means a survey found that the typical British person says that 29 degrees or above is too hot. A random sample of 30 summer days in Jacksonville is taken. Use Amy's model to predict the number of these days when the mean air temperature would be considered too hot for a typical British person visiting Jacksonville. Okay, this is a fairly standard question about a normal distribution. So we have a mean 27 standard deviation 2.1. Let's go ahead and get started down below. 
we're going to be looking for the probability that the temperature is greater than 29. We have again, let's just write down that information. And our sample size, uh, by the way, that's important. Our sample size was 30, 30 summer days. So n equals 30. And we're looking for the probability that the temperature is greater than or equal to 29 because 29 was also considered too hot. So it's greater than or equal to. And uh, we can calculate this using our calculators. And for those that are graphically inclined, I might just draw a quick normal distribution here. Also, it's good practice for me. Eventually, I'll get good at drawing these normal distributions on here. But this is our normal distribution. They've given us a mean of 27. And if you were to represent this graphically, you would say we're looking for the area under this curve uh, above where that temperature is 29. So we're actually looking for that area, which also represents the probability of the temperature being greater than 29. So that's the idea here. Okay, so how do we do this with a calculator? Well, we go into a function called normal CDF or norm CDF, and that belongs in the distribution menu. Even if you have a different calculator, usually it's still called the distribution menu. And on mine, it comes up with this menu here, and it's the second option, normal CDF. That's the one I want. And you need to know the syntax for your particular calculator. Mine is, I need to put in the the minimum. So using this diagram, this is the minimum. Remember, we're looking for this area. This is the minimum of that area. And so that's 29. And the upper limit essentially goes, these curves, these normal curves, they go off into infinity. They never actually touch the x-axis. But in the calculator, we just put a large number, so 9999. And then we put the mean after that and then the standard deviation. And once you input all of that, you will get your probability. So it's about 17% for the days above 29 degrees. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to write down what I input into the calculator first. And our answer was 0.17, etc. Now you don't really need to write that down. The method mark here is for writing this bit, this P of uh, the temperature above 29. That's where you're getting the method mark. As long as you write that particular notation down, you should get that method mark. And then remember what the question was asking. It was saying, use Amy's model to predict the number of days. So we have a probability. How do we translate to the number of days? Well, we need to multiply that by the number of days in our sample, right? So 0.17 multiplied by 30. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll take that answer and multiply it by 30 to get the number of days. So multiply by 30 and we get 5.11 approximately, 5.11. And the question has asked us for a number of days, we're not gonna say 5.11 days, we're going to say uh, five days. So approximately five days out of those 30 days were too hot for a British person. So above 29 degrees. Okay, so that was question or part D for two marks and question one for a total of nine marks. Question two says an orthonologist believes that there is a relationship between the tail length T millimeters and the wind length W millimeters of female hook build kites. A random sample of size 10 is taken from a database of these kites and the relevant data is given in the table below. So these are the tail lengths and these are the wing lengths. The ornithologist plans to use a linear regression model based on these data and interpolate or extrapolate as necessary to estimate the wing length of other female hook build kites from their tail length. And part A, part one says explain what is meant by extrapolation and part two says explain the dangers of extrapolation. Extrapolation is using the existing data to make predictions about data outside of that original set of data. For example, if you notice a trend with this sample size of 10, you might then be able to make a prediction about a kite with a longer tail length than what was measured or a shorter one and similarly for the wing length as well. The danger with this is that it becomes unreliable because you're making predictions. And every time you make a prediction outside of the data you have, there's a level of 
uncertainty or a level of estimation to that. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to summarize this down here for part A. Okay, so extrapolation is using the trend or line of best fit to make predictions outside the original data range. And part two, the dangers of this. The danger of extrapolation is that the trend may not continue. Basically, you don't actually know what's going to happen outside of the data you have. Anything could actually happen, so you're just making an estimate. Okay, so that's part A. Part B says the ornithologist attempts to calculate the product moment correlation coefficient R and obtains a value of 1.3. Explain how she should be able to identify that this is incorrect without carrying out any further calculations. So if you've worked with this before, you know that it has to be between negative one and one. This is like a percentage and it represents a level of correlation between the two sets of data. So if you've got 1.3, you can't have more than a perfect correlation, which would be one. Um, so 1.3 is clearly wrong. So let's go ahead and write that down for part B. Um, so maximum. The maximum value of R is 1, so 1.3 is impossible or clearly incorrect. Part C says use your calculator to find the correct value of the product moment correlation coefficient, R. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this on this calculator. May not be useful to you if you don't have the same model, but your calculator may have a similar uh, you know, method to it. Okay, so firstly we have to input this data into lists. So on mine, I go to stat and then uh, edit and it comes up with lists. So I'm going to input all of this, uh, the, the tail measurements in list one and the wing measurements in list two. Okay, I have that all entered now. Once it's all entered, I need to go back to the stat menu and go across to calc. Again, your calculator may look different. Try to find the, the calculation menu in regards to statistics. Then I need to go down to lin reg, standing for linear regression. And once I put that in, I need to go list one and list two. So enter, and it gives me some statistics here. Now R is the one I'm looking for. This is the product moment correlation coefficient. And I get a value of 0.7627 and so on. And the question said, uh, well, it didn't say to round off, so I would probably write quite a few of those decimal places and then maybe round it off. So uh, for part C, let's go ahead and write that down. We had R equal to 0.762758857 and yeah, again, I am i don't know what to suggest in terms of how many decimals to write. I would probably just err on the side of caution and write them all down, but then I would go ahead and probably round this off to maybe 0 0.76 or 0 0.763, something like that. Okay, so this rounds off to 0 0.763. Okay, that's part C. Part D says, stating your hypothesis clearly test at the 1% significance level whether or not there is evidence that the product moment correlation coefficient for the population is positive. For this, you're going to need to firstly set up your hypothesis test and then you're going to need your formula booklet with the table of values in it. So for part D, let's firstly set up our test. We have an R of 0.763, our alpha, or our significance level is 1% or 0.01. Our null hypothesis is we're assuming that there is no correlation. Pretty much always when you're looking at hypothesis tests for the uh, correlation coefficient, you assume for the null hypothesis that it's zero. Um, so that's pretty safe bet. And in this case it is because we're trying to find or we're trying to show that it isn't zero. So uh, we're saying rho is equal to zero for the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis H1 is rho greater than zero. We have a sample size of 10. Remember that they told us that in the question. So from all of this information, we need to find a critical value and that's going to be from the table. So our critical value, pull your table up from your formula booklet. It looks like this critical values for correlation coefficients. This is on page 37 of this particular booklet and uh, using the information sample size 10 and significance level 0 0.01 go across 
and we get 0.7155 for our critical value. Then write that down, so 0.7155, and compare it to the R we have, uh, 0.763. And then you just need to ask yourself which one's bigger, the R or the critical value. So in this case, R is bigger than the critical value. Now here you need to understand what this number represents. This is saying that you need an R greater than this number to support your alternate hypothesis. So in other words, if you have a correlation coefficient of less than 0.7155, then your R is too low to say that there's a correlation there. If you have an R greater than that, then you have evidence to suggest that the population correlation coefficient is actually greater than zero. So then summarize that. So uh, we have so we have evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the population row is greater than zero. Okay, that was part D. Part E says explain what your test in part D suggests about female hook build kites. Let's go back to the question to get a bit of context again. Remember he was measuring the tail length and the wing length of these uh, birds and he was looking for a relationship between them. Now we found evidence that there is a relationship. In other words, the correlation coefficient is greater than zero. So that suggests a relationship. So if we're trying to answer this question, explain what your test suggests. Well, that suggests there is a relationship between the tail length and the wing length or the wingspan of these kites. So let's go ahead and see if we can summarize that for part E. A lot of writing in this question, but that's fine. So the test, okay, the test suggests at 1% level of significance that there is a correlation between tail length and wing length of female hook build kites. E.g. on average kites with longer tails have longer wings and vice versa. That would be a two way relationship. Okay, that was part E and the end of question two for a total of eight marks. Question three says a company maintains machines. It has two types of contract, a service contract and a repair contract. The company classes its customers as new customers or existing customers. The table gives information about the company's customers. The company is going to survey its customers. It plans to take a sample of 100 of its customers stratified by customer type and contract type. And part A says work out how many new customers with repair contracts should be sampled. This question is fairly straightforward. We can figure out the percentage of new customers that have a repair contract, and that will be the number that should be sampled out of this 100. So we need to add all of these up, find 82 as a percentage, and then we're essentially done. So adding these up, 65 plus 82 plus 231 plus 262, we get 640. So that percentage will be 82 divided by 640 and multiply by 100 and we get 12.8125%. Now, if we're talking about people in a sample, we would round that up to 13. So let's go ahead and write this uh, working out down below for part A. Firstly, we worked out the total customers. This is 640. Then the percentage, we got 12.8, etc., And we rounded that off to 13. So we would sample 13 customers out of those 100. Okay, on to part B. Part B says the company has developed a test for a certain fault in the machines it services. The test sometimes gives incorrect results. The company collects information from a sample of randomly selected machines. 2% of the machines have the fault. 70% of the machines with the fault test positive for the fault. 10% of the machines without the fault test positive for the fault. A machine is selected at random from the sample of the machines and test positive for the fault. And part B, part one says calculate the probability that the machine has the fault. Okay, part of the difficulty with this question is actually deciphering all of this information. It's very wordy and written sort of badly or not, probably not intentionally, but they've packed a lot of information into this question. But what you need to recognize about this question is it's talking about conditional probability. And what tells you that is this part of the question here. It says a machine is selected at random and test positive for the fault, calculate the probability that the machine has the fault. So they've given you a condition here, it tests positive. That's the condition, you're looking for a probability based on that condition, therefore conditional probability. 
Also, you need to know the formula for conditional probability. Now, there is a formula in the formula booklet. Uh, let's go ahead and pull that up. So here it is under statistics and probability. This is the formula for conditional probability. Like a lot of the examples in the formula booklet, it looks way more complicated than it actually has to be. There's a much more simplified version of this formula that we can use for this question. So that's the main thing we're going to need to solve this. And we're also going to have to decipher some of this information, as I said before. So let's go ahead and get started on part B down below. The first thing is I'm going to write down some of the information they gave us. So they told us the percentage of the machines with a fault. I'll just go back again. So here they tell us 2% of the machines have the fault. So I'm going to also give that a label. I'm going to call that A. You could maybe call that F, might make more sense. But I'm just going to use A, B and C for this question. So machines with fault was 2% of the machines. So therefore, you can also write down the machines without a fault, it must be 98%. You could argue you don't have to write this down, it's just going to make my explanation a bit more straightforward. So I am going to also write this down, so machines without fault, 98%. We're also going to need the percentage of machines that test positive, and I'll call that C. And going back to the question again, so we need to find out how many machines test positive or the percentage and they don't tell us. So they tell us that 2% have a fault, 70% of the machines with the fault test positive, 10% of the machines without the fault test positive. So they give you these percentages, they don't actually tell you what percentage tests positive. But we can figure it out using that information because we know 2% have the fault. So if 70% with the fault test positive, then that's 70% of 2%, right? And if 10% without the fault test positive, that's 10% of the other 98% test positive. So we can figure out, therefore, the percentage of machines that test positive using this information here. So uh, that's going to be my calculation to work out what I've called C here, machines that test positive. So again, it was 70% of the 2%, so 0.7 times 0 0.02, plus 10% of that 98%, machines without the fault. So 0 0.1 times 0.98. And that's how we're figuring out the percentage that test positive. Let's go ahead and put that into a calculator. So 0 0.7 times 0 0.02 plus 0.1 multiplied by 0 0.98, 0 0.112 or 11.2%. And I'm just going to make a note where these numbers come from in case anyone is still a bit confused. Hopefully if I actually write it down, uh, maybe it clears it up. So this is 70% of 2% and that one's 10% of 98%. Again, all of that information straight from the question. Okay, why did we need uh, the percentage of the machines test positive? Well, the, as I said before, we're going to use the conditional probability formula. It looks like this. Now we're going to be looking for the probability of A, the machine has a fault, given that the machine tests positive for the fault. So that looks like this, probability of A given C. And the formula for that is the probability of A intersect C divided by the probability of C. From the information in the question, they don't give you either of these. We've already figured out probability of C, that's why we did this. Also, we don't have the probability of A intersect C, but we can work that out. Using, again, the conditional probability formula for a different conditional probability. So they tell us in the question, the probability of C given A. This is the probability that the machine tests positive given that it has a fault. So that's this one here. This is what I'm calling P, probability of C given A. Probability that it tests positive given that it has a fault. Okay, so that probability of C given A, 70%. Okay, also we have a formula for that. So this is also going to equal the probability of A intersect C divided by the probability of A. So we have these two things, probability of C given A and probability of A. We can use this equation now to solve for the probability of A intersect C. So the probability of A intersect C 
is going to be the probability of A times the probability of C given A. Probability of A was 2%. Probability of C given A was, as we said, 0.7. So this would be, uh, well, 7 times 2 is 14, then we'd have 0 0.014. Okay, so now we have the probability of A intersect C, and we have the probability of C, which we've just figured out. We can work out the probability of A given C. Let's go ahead and write this down. Plugging those in, we've got 0 0.014 divided by uh, 0 0.112. And putting that into a calculator, 0 0.014 divided by 0.112, we get 0.125 or 12.5%. Okay, there we go. So that is the probability that a machine has a fault given that it tests positive for a fault. And that's actually pretty low if you think about it. If you test something and it tests positive for a fault, you'd want to be pretty confident that it actually has that fault in it. So 12.5%, you want that to be higher. And I think that actually leads into the next question. So that was part B. Part two says, comment on the usefulness of the company's test. Give a reason for your answer. Okay, so as I was kind of leading to there, if you test something for a fault and it says it has a fault, you'd want it to be a pretty high percentage that the machine actually has something wrong with it. In this case, we're only getting 12.5%. So out of all the machines they're testing, only 12.5% actually have something wrong with them. I would say that's not very useful to the company. Let's say they are sending people out to repair these machines. In 87.5% of those cases, those people won't actually be repairing anything. There won't actually be a fault to repair. So let's go ahead and try to summarize those thoughts in a couple of sentences. So Okay, so what I've written here is 12.5% is a low probability after testing, so it is hard to know if the machine has a fault, even after testing for the fault. Most machines that test positive do not have faults, so not useful or not a useful test. Probably more words than necessary there, but hopefully you get the idea. So that was part B, part two. Part C says when the company services the machines, it checks two components, alpha and beta, for wear and tear and replaces these if needed. Event A is that component alpha needs to be replaced. Event B is that component beta needs to be replaced. The probability that the component alpha needs to be replaced is 0.35. The probability that component beta needs to be replaced is 0.55. The probability that neither component needs to be replaced is 0.28. Show that events A and B are not independent. Okay, so for independent events, this is the main condition that needs to be fulfilled. So you need the probability of A intersect B equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. If they are not independent, this will not be the case. So the probability of A intersect B will not equal the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. That's what I'm going to use to show the events are not independent. And for this, I need the probability of A intersect B, or in this case, I'm talking about alpha and beta. So the probability of alpha intersect beta, and I need these separately. So I already have the probability of alpha and the probability of beta separately, 0 0.35 and 0 0.55, and I need to figure out the probability of alpha intersect beta. So I'll get started on part C down below. I'm going to use a Venn diagram just to make it clearer how I'm working this out. So for part C, I would go ahead and write down what I know about independent events. It's always a good idea to state the rule that you're using or the formula that you're relying on to prove uh, or show the, what the question is asking. Then we had the probability of alpha, this was equal to 0.35 and the probability of beta was 0.55. Let's assume for a minute they are independent. So if you draw a Venn diagram of independent events, the circles don't overlap, there's no intersection. They're two separate events. So this would be alpha, this would be beta. And going back to the question quickly, they also tell us the probability that neither component needs to be replaced is 0.28. So in a Venn diagram, uh, we'd have these probabilities here, we'd have this probability 0.28 outside of those two. So the probability that neither of these events happens is 0.28. Also, we know that all of the probabilities within a Venn diagram need to add up to one. So that means then that these two events, the probability of them happening needs to be one take 0.28, right? And the way that we represent that probability of the of 
alpha or beta, so everything inside both of those sets is the probability of alpha union beta. This needs to be 1 take 0.28. This is 0.72. Okay, so that's everything inside there. As you know from your set notation that you've used before and from working with Venn diagrams before, this pretty much already proves that these are not independent because we can already find the probability of alpha plus the probability of beta, which is 0 0.35 plus 0 0.55, that's 0 0.9, and that's not 0 0.72. So you can already see these events overlap. There should be an intersection. So this should look like this, okay? Because when you add these up, it's not equaling 0 0.72. So we can work out that intersection now. So the probability of alpha intersect beta is going to be uh, these two added together, 0.35 plus 0.55, subtract 0.72. This is 0.9, take 0.72 or 0.18. And that represents this area in here that is where they overlap. And now we can work out the probability of alpha multiplied by the probability of beta. So 0.35 times 0.55, and we get 0.1925 which is not equal to 0.18 or not equal to the probability of alpha intersect beta. Okay, that was part C. Now, interestingly, looking at the mark scheme, the only lines of working that you need here is these two for those two marks. You don't actually need any of this. So if you can see how to work out the probability of, of alpha intersect beta straight away, just do it, you don't actually need to show any of that working out, just you can jump to that point and you'd be fine for those two marks there. Okay, on to the next part, part D. Part D says, find the probability that the component alpha or component beta needs to be replaced, but not both. All right, for part D, we're looking for the probability of alpha needing to be replaced or beta needing to be replaced. We know that when we say or, is the same as the union. So this is going to have probability of alpha union B in it, but we don't want both. So actually this is the same as saying the probability of the union subtract the probability of the intersection, right? This is the probability of both happening. This is the probability of alpha or beta. So we know these things. We know the union is 0.72. We know the intersect is 0.18. So 0.72 take 0.18, that's all we have to work out here. Uh, 62 is going to be 0.54. Okay, so that's my final answer there. There is another way of doing that. So uh, if you think, of, if you look at this Venn diagram here, um, when you add these together, 0.35 plus 0.55, you're double counting that intersection. So when you're doing, uh, you can do it as 0.35 plus 0.55 and you need to subtract that intersection twice. So you need to do subtract two times 0.18 because you've counted it in set beta, you've counted it in set alpha. So two times 0.18 and then that will give you the same answer 0.54. So two possible ways of answering that question for part D and that was a uh, question three. Oops, question three for a total of 11 marks. Question four says, the company has a customer services call center. The company believes that the time taken to complete a call to the call center may be modeled by a normal distribution with mean 16 minutes and standard deviation sigma minutes. Given that 10% of the calls take longer than 22 minutes, part A says show that to three significant figures, the value of sigma is 4.68. For this, we're going to use the Z score formula. They give us a mean of 16 and they tell us the probability of x greater than 22 or the length of the call is 0.1 or 10%. So the Z score formula says the Z score equals x take x bar divided by sigma. Now this 10% here is effectively giving us the Z score for this x value of 22. So let's go ahead and draw a, a little normal distribution here. So we have a mean of 16 and we have a value here at 22 and they're telling us that any values over that 22 
or the values over that 22 represent 10% of the calls. Now that percentage is matched with a Z score. And you can use the table in your formula booklet if you like, or your calculator, either way. So I'm going to use my calculator to find this Z score. So for this, I want to use inv norm, and I just put in 0.1, and it gives me the Z value. Typically, what I've found with these exams is they round these to four significant figures. So I'm going to round this to 1.282. Now, it is a negative because I didn't put 0.9. I should have done, actually, I should have done this. Um, so let me just do this again. Okay, 0.9 because this is the upper 10% and I'll get a positive number. So 1.282 is my Z score, 1.282. And that was all of the values over 22. So my X value here is 22. My X bar is 16 and I'm looking for Sigma. So notice that that's the unknown in this equation. So I can use this to solve for Sigma. Rearranging this, I will have sigma equal to 22 take 16 is 6 divided by 1.282 and I need to round this off to three significant figures. So let's put that into a calculator. 6 divided by my answer there. I get 4.68182 etc and that rounds to 4.68 to 3 significant figures. Okay, so that was part A. Part B says calculate the percentage of calls that take less than 13 minutes. Okay, now that I have the standard deviation, I'm able to work that out. So for part B, again, I'm going to use my calculator for this. I'm looking for the probability of X less than 13. And I can use the normal cumulative distribution function on my calculator. So let's go ahead and pull that up. So normal CDF is what you want here. And the syntax on mine is the minimum value. When you're looking for less than, the minimum is going to be some large number, so negative 9,000. Uh, the max is 13, the mean is 16, and the standard deviation is what we just worked out, 4.68. And once you've got that all plugged in correctly, uh, press enter, and I get an answer of 0.2607. And I'm not sure what to round off to here, so 26.1% might be okay. So I'll just write in what I entered in the calculator and I got approximately 26.1%. Um, just going back to the normal distribution again, we found this probability here. So we had a value of 13 minutes and we looked for that probability below that. So that was, uh, we got an answer of 26.1%. Okay. That was part B. Part C says a supervisor in the call center claims that the mean call time is less than 16 minutes. He collects data on his own call times. 20% of the supervisor's calls take more than 17 minutes to complete. 10% of the supervisor's calls take less than eight minutes to complete. Assuming that the time the supervisor takes to complete a call may be modeled by a normal distribution, estimate the mean and standard deviation of the time taken by the supervisor to complete a call. All right, this is essentially a simultaneous equations question. Using this information, we're going to create two separate equations that allow us to solve for the mean and standard deviation. So let's go ahead and get started. Firstly, I'll start by summarizing what they told us. So they told us 20% of the calls are longer than 17 minutes, and they told us 10% of the calls are less than eight minutes. And again, we're going to use this Z score formula. So for this 10 and 20%, we're going to have Z scores. We just worked out the Z score for 10%. So let's go ahead and calculate the Z score for the 20%. So inv norm of 0.8. And we get 0.8416 rounding to four significant figures. So my first equation here is going to be 0.8416 equal to the X value of 17 take the mean X bar divided by the standard deviation. Actually, I should use mu here because we're talking about the entire sample of his calls. So for the second equation, I already have the Z score for 10%. That was negative 1.282. We're using negative now because it's less than eight minutes. So negative 1.282 is equal to the X value of eight, subtract the mean 
divided by a standard deviation. Now we have our two equations. We can rearrange them in terms of either mu or sigma and then set them equal to each other. I might do it in terms of mu or the mean. So multiply by sigma, we would get 0.8416 uh, sigma equal to 17 take mu. And then add that, subtract the other one, mu equals 17 take 0.8416 sigma. And then rearranging this in terms of mu, we would get 8 take mu equal to negative 1.282. And then mu equal to 1.282 plus 8. Uh, that's 1.282 sigma, I should have written there. Okay, so now I have both of those equations in terms of mu. I can set them equal to each other and solve for sigma. So we would have, therefore, we would have 17 take 0.8416 equal to 1.282 sigma plus 8 and then add the 0.8416 to the right hand side so 1.282 plus that let's work that out so 1.282 plus 0.8416 2.1236 so 2.1236 sigma is equal to 17 take 8 which is nine, and then sigma is going to be nine divided by this. So nine divided by our answer there, and I get 4.238 and so on, rounding to four significant figures, 4.238. So approximately 4.238 for my standard deviation. Plug that into either of these for the mean, uh, using this one, 17 subtract 0.8416 multiplied by this. Let's work that out. So 17 subtract, and I get 13.433 and so on, rounding to four significant figures again, I get 13.43. Okay, and that's my mean. And that should be everything for part C. Estimate the mean and standard deviation. So that's the mean and standard deviation of the call times for the supervisor for part C. Part D says state giving a reason whether or not the calculations in part C support the supervisor's claim. Let's go back to the claim again. Uh, he said that the mean call time is less than 16 minutes. So his claim is that the mean or the average for the entire call center is less than 16 minutes. And he's and the data he's used is his own call times. So he is making a claim about the average of everyone in the call center based on his own personal call times. All right, full disclosure here. I would say for this question that his calculations do not support his claim. And that's different to what the mark scheme says. So the mark scheme says his calculations do support his claim because if we look at it, he had a mean of 13 roughly and a standard deviation of four. So that is clearly less than 16. So it supports his claim in some sense, but the justification for my answer is that he's only taking data from one person the mean is for everyone in the call center so the idea that he's only using data from one person and a supervisor at that a supervisor usually is better at that job so if you're talking about technical support or something he's going to be able to help people faster than people who've just started in the job and things like that so you're taking one person's data for a supervisor and making a claim about everyone, I think that it doesn't support the claim that he's making. However, I get what they're trying to say. They're just trying to make you interpret the what you worked out in part C. I think they could have worded this better. So they could have said, do the calculations show that his calls are less taking less time than the average or something? They could have worded it like that. But the idea that they support his claim, I don't think is entirely correct. Anyways, just want to point that out. Uh, I'm not going to write an answer with this. You can see in the mark scheme, it's pretty straightforward. It just says, yes, they do, because the mean is less than the stated mean of 16 minutes. So there you go. That's part D for one mark. Again, I'm disagreeing slightly with the mark scheme. If someone wants to point out why I'm wrong, feel free, go ahead. Um, but yeah, there you go. That was question four, the main parts were 10 marks and that part D was one mark. 
Apologies for not doing a full answer. It's just because, well, the answer in the mark seems pretty straightforward. Check it out if you want to. Question five says, a fast food company has a scratch card competition, has ordered scratch cards for the competition and requested that 45% of the scratch cards be winning scratch cards. A random sample of 20 of the scratch cards is collected from each of the eight of the fast food company's stores. Part A says, assuming that 45% of the scratch cards are winning scratch cards, calculate the probability that in at least two of the eight stores, 12 or more of the scratch cards are winning scratch cards. All right, this is a binomial distribution question and we're going to be using the binomial distribution function to sort this out and we're going to break it up into two parts. So in the first part, we want to work out the probability that 12 or more of the scratch cards are winning scratch cards. We're going to work that out as a separate probability. Then we'll work out the probability of that occurring in at least two of the eight stores. So let's go ahead and get started on that for part A. So for winning scratch card, the probability is 0.45 or 45%. They are visiting eight stores and they are looking at 20 cards in each one. So for the first part of this problem, I'm going to have a binomial distribution for the winning scratch cards uh, with a sample size of 20 and the probability of success of 0.45 and we're looking for the probability that we get 12 or more winning scratch cards. So we can write that as W greater than or equal to 12. So it's important to get those inequality symbols correct. So when it says 12 or more, it's greater than or equals to. If it said more than 12, just greater than. Pay attention carefully to the wording in the question to get those correct. Now for my particular calculator, I need to rearrange this slightly. I need the probability to be less than just because of the way it goes into the calculator. So this is the same as the probability of W less than or equal to 11. And now I'm going to work this out on my calculator. So I'm going to do one subtract the binomial CDF, binomial cumulative distribution function. And the syntax on my calculator is the sample size, the probability of success and the maximum. So in this case, 11. So let's go ahead and put that into a calculator. One subtract and the binomial distribution function is in my distributions menu and go down until you get to binome CDF. Now again, your calculator might look different to this. It should be a similar name for your function though. And as I said, sample size, the probability of success and the maximum value we want. And I get an answer of point. 13076. So I'm just going to write down 0 0.13, uh, 0 0.13, and then some dots to show that continues. That now becomes the probability of success in my next calculation. Now I have a different binomial distribution of the stores, and this has a sample size of 8 and a probability of success that I just worked out, so 0 0.13. And that's what I'm going to use to calculate the next part. So now I'm looking for the probability that the number of stores with 12 or more winning scratch cards is greater than two. Okay, just go back again to revisit the wording. So in at least two, so that's the same as two or more. Again, be careful of the wording. Make sure you understand what these statements mean. In at least two, 12 or more scratch cards are winning scratch cards. We have that probability of success now. We just worked out. So we can use that for this part. So the probability that the stores are greater than or equal to two. Again, I need to change that to a maximum. So this is going to be one subtract the probability of the stores being less than or equal to one. Okay, then put that into a calculator. This is now going to be the function with sample size of eight, probability of success of 0.13 and the maximum of one. So let's put that in now, eight, uh, use the answer from the previous calculation. So answer and one, and I get an answer of 0.2818, etc. And you could round this off if you like to 28.2%. I don't think it told us what to round off to. No, it didn't say anything to round off to. So that's going to be my final answer there, 28.2% for part A. 
Part B says write down two conditions under which the normal distribution may be used as an approximation to the binomial distribution. This question has come up before, so there is a standard answer to this for part B, and this is something you need to memorize. So a normal distribution can be approximated when n is large and p is close to 0.5. Okay, so there are your two conditions there. N is large and P is close to 0.5. Part C says a random sample of 300 of the scratch cards is taken. Assuming that 45% of all the scratch cards are winning scratch cards, use a normal approximation to find the probability that at most 122 of these 300 scratch cards are winning scratch cards. Okay, so we're using a normal approximation now. So that involves finding the mean and standard deviation. So that's the first thing I'm going to do here. We had a sample size of 300. Probability of success is still 0.45. So the expected value or the mean for a normal approximation is the probability of success multiplied by the sample size. So 0.545 times 300, and that's 135 for the mean. Standard deviation is the square root of n p q. Q is the probability of failure. So one take p. So let's work that out. So n is 300 multiplied by 0.45, multiplied by 0.55, which will be Q. And I get a standard deviation of 8.62 approximately. So then I can say my binomial function can be approximated by normal distribution with a mean of 135 and a standard deviation of 8.62. Next, we're looking for, I've already forgotten what the probability was I'm looking for. It's the probability, uh, that at most 122 of these 300 scratch cards are winning scratch cards. Again, pay attention to the language. At most 122 is 122 or less. So in other words, less than or equal to 122. So we're looking for the probability of winning scratch cards being less than or equal to 122. And always remember with a normal approximation, use the continuity correction. So this is equal to the probability of W less than or equal to 1. 22.5 that's the continuity correction there's plenty of good videos on why we add that half there for the continuity correction but it is an important step to get the correct answer here next this is what we're working out we have our mean and standard deviation all we need to do is essentially plug this into a calculator using the normal function and it, this is a maximum so the minimum will be some large number our max is 122.5, our mean, and our standard deviation we have. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug that in. And I'm going to use the answer key for to get the standard deviation in there to save me entering all of that in. So enter, and I get a, a probability of 0.073439, etc. And let's say round this off to 7.34%. Okay. So the probability of at most 122 of the scratch cards winning about 7%. Part D says, given that 122 of the 300 scratch cards are winning scratch cards, comment on whether or not there is evidence at the 5% significance level that the proportion of the company's scratch cards that are winning scratch cards is different from 45%. Okay, so for part D, we need to do a little hypothesis test. So let's interpret our result from the previous part of the question. So we start off by assuming 45% are winning and we worked out the probability that at most 122 are winning and we got an answer of about 7%. So actually for part D, I might just draw a quick diagram to illustrate what I'm talking about here. So for part D, let's look at a normal distribution quickly and figure out what we're talking about. So we had a mean of 135 and we looked at the probability of less than 122, which would be, I don't know, somewhere over here. And we got about 7%. Now, when you're looking at a normal distribution, if you assume the mean, you want most of the values to fall within a range of about 95, 96%. And if they're falling outside of that range, then that's evidence to suggest this isn't actually the mean. Now, depending on the significance level you're looking at, if we looked at the 10% level of significance, this would actually be outside that range. We're looking at the 5% significance level, which means this is inside of that range, inside of that 
significance. So at the 5% level of significance, there's insufficient evidence to suggest that the proportion of the winning scratch cards is different than 45%. Because again, this 7% is greater than 5% essentially. That's the test we're doing here. So for part D, because it's one mark, I think that's all we really need to state. So there is insufficient evidence. And the reason essentially is that, um, you know, 7% is greater than 5%, okay? So then the evidence, the evidence suggests P equals 0.45. Okay, that was part D for one mark and question five for a total of 11 marks. And that's the end of the statistics part of this paper. Stay tuned for the mechanics questions coming up next. We're on to the mechanics section now and question one says a car moves along a straight horizontal road. The car starts from a rest at fixed point A on the road and moves with constant acceleration for 30 seconds, reaching a speed of 15 meters per second. This speed is then maintained. When the car has been moving for 15 seconds, a motorbike starts from rest at A and moves along the same road in the same direction as the car. The motorbike accelerates at 1.5 meters per second squared so that it catches up with the car when the car has been moving for T seconds. Part A says using the same axis, sketch the speed time graph of the car and the speed time graph of the motorbike up to the time when the motorbike catches up with the car. With a speed time graph, the speed is the y-axis, the time is the x-axis. When something is accelerating, that's when you have a gradient. The gradient essentially is the acceleration of the object. And when it's moving at constant speed, you have a flat line. So for the graph of the car here, we're going to have a line with a certain gradient. And then once it reaches 15 meters per second, then the graph will flatten out. For the motorbike, that is accelerating the whole time until it catches up to the car. And that will be aligned with a gradient of one and a half. So let's go ahead and start to sketch this. So it doesn't have to be exact, but they do give us some values that we'll need to use. So let's start off over here like this. Okay, I've set up my axes. I've got speed in meters per second and time in seconds. Let's start with the car. We know it had a constant acceleration for 30 seconds and then it started going at a constant speed. So we could start at zero, zero, and draw a line up to 1530. Just as a reminder, it said uh, it moved at constant acceleration for 30 seconds, reaching a speed of 15 meters per second. So that's what that would look like. And then the speed is constant, so that would flatten out. Okay, that's the car, and then 15 seconds pass until the motorbike starts from the same point. So if we take zero as the time that the car started, 15 seconds pass will start here for the motorbike, and then it's accelerating at 1.5 meters per second. So firstly, we know that it's accelerating faster than the car, right? We can work out this acceleration. We can do the speed divided by the time, 15 divided by 30. That acceleration would be 0.5 meters per second for the car, the motorbike is accelerating at 1.5 meters per second. Let's try to make this kind of accurate. So remember acceleration is meters per second per second. So if it's going 1.5 meters per second per second, so that would be like 15 meters per second every 10 seconds. So if we go across 10 seconds on the X axis, we'd go up 15 seconds on the speed axis. So we'd have a point at 15, 25, if we're starting at 15. So that's all I need two points and then I can draw that line in. So you could keep drawing this line forever, but the motorbike must catch up to the car at some point. So we can pick a spot and that's where we're going to give the value of T. So go back down, join that back up to the time axis and that's going to be our value of T where it, where it catches up to the car. Okay, so the, our key values there are 15 seconds where the motorbike starts, 15 meters per second where the car reaches its constant velocity and 30 seconds as well. And then you also need that gradient of the motorbike to be steeper than the gradient of the acceleration of the car. And it doesn't really matter where T is because you haven't worked that out yet. So T can be essentially anywhere as long as it's past the point where the car has reached constant acceleration, then you'll get the four marks there. Okay, on to part B. Part B says find the speed of the motorbike at the instant it catches up with the car. 
So for part B, you need to know the area under the speed time graph is the distance that that object has traveled. So the area under the motorbikes graph should be the same as the area under the graph of the car if they've traveled the same distance. Remember, we're talking about when the motorbike catches up to the car, they'll be at the same distance from the starting point. So what we want to do for this one is to find an expression for the area under each graph, set them equal to each other, and then hopefully solve for T. So for part B, oh, that was part A, by the way. Part B, let's firstly state we understand how to solve this. So the distance is equal to the area under the graph. And for the car, the area under this graph will be the area of this triangle here, and then the area of this rectangle. So to find the area of that triangle, well, we know the base and the height, that's not too difficult. So let's start off with the car. We'll have base times height divided by two. So 30 times 15 divided by two, same as 15 times 15, right? 30 divided by two is 15. And then we need to add on the area of that rectangle. What would that expression look like? Well, we know the height is 15 and we just need an expression for the length. Well, where this rectangle ends is at T. So to find that length there, we'd do T subtract 30 and that would give us that remaining distance or length between 30 and T. So to find the area of this rectangle, we do the height of 15 multiplied by t take 30. And then this is a bit tricky simplifying this. There is a shortcut here. If you simplify it slightly differently to this, it's fine. You'll still get the correct answer. It just might take a little bit longer, but there is a little shortcut here. You can factorize a 15 out from both terms. So 15, take 15 out, we'll have 15 plus t minus 30. And then you can simplify the terms inside the brackets and we'd have 15 multiplied by 15 subtract 30 is negative 15. So what's left in the brackets there would be T take 15. So basically I just avoided having to multiply 15 by 15, etc. Okay, so for next for the motorbike, let's do the area under the graph of the motorbike. So this is a bit easier because it's just a triangle except we don't have the height or the base. So we need expressions for both of those. So we know that it's going to be half times something because it's a triangle. So the base, we could do the same thing as we did for the car. We could say T take 15 would be this length here, the base. So T take 15. And then the height. Now this is a bit tricky. You need a formula for this. So to get this speed here at this point, we're going to need to use the fact that speed equals acceleration times time. So the amount of time that something's been accelerating, that will be the speed you're looking at. So for this point here, we have a constant acceleration of the motorbike we know is 1.5 and the time it's taken is actually T take 15. Okay, so that's going to be an expression for the speed for the motorbike. So this was the base, the height is the speed. We're going to use this 1.5 times T take 15. And then we have an expression for the area under the graph of the motorbikes speed time graph. Let's simplify this one. So 1.5 divided by two is 0.75 and then T take 15 multiplied by t take 15 we could write as t take 15 squared and then we want to set these two things equal to each other to solve for t the time when the motorbike catches up to the car so i might do that over here we are going to say that therefore 15 times t take 15 equals 0.75 multiplied by t take 15 all squared Divide by T take 15, we'll have 15 equal to 0.75 multiplied by T take 15. 15 divided by three quarters or four thirds of 15, that's 20. Basically 15 divided by three multiplied by four. So then we've got T take 15 equal to 20 and then add 15 to the other side, T is going to equal 35 seconds. Okay. 
So back in context then, at th after 35 seconds after the car started, that's when the motorbike caught up to the car. So then we have to use that value of t to find the speed. So plug that into here, basically. So we'll have 1.5 times 35 take 15. So the speed equals 1.5 times 35 take 15. This is 20. So 1.5 times 20 equals, uh, well, 20 plus a half is 30 meters per second for the speed of the motorbike. Okay, that was part B. So you can see actually on my graph, I'm a bit off. If this was accurate, the T should be more over here. But again, it doesn't really matter because we hadn't worked it out yet. So for part A, again, your T could have been really anywhere as long as you had these other points accurate. Okay, so that was question one for nine marks. Question two starts off with a diagram and it says the ladder AB shown in figure one has length 2A and weight W. The ladder rests in equilibrium with end A on rough horizontal ground and end B against a smooth vertical wall. The ladder rests in a vertical plane perpendicular to the wall and it's inclined at angle theta to the ground. The coefficient of friction between the ladder and ground is mu. The ladder is on the point of slipping. The ladder is modeled as a uniform rod. Part A says show that mu equals one over two tan theta. All right, if you like, you could get a highlighter here. Haven't done this for a while. And perhaps highlight or just underline the key piece of information. So we have length 2A. We have a weight of W. We know the ladder rests in equilibrium. So that's important. Um, this stuff rests in vertical plane perpendicular to the wall. That just means it's not kind of slipping sideways. So the point is you don't really have to take in three dimensional movement. We're just talking about up and down. Um, it's inclined at angle theta. They've drawn that in already. Coefficient of friction is mu and the ladder is the po on the point of slipping. That's going to be important as well. The main points, I guess, are the length, is two, the length is 2a and the weight is w. So let's go ahead and firstly try to draw some forces in here. So we know that the it's a uniform rod, so the weight is going to be from the center and the weight is mg essentially. So let's draw that in firstly. We've got mg here and then we know that the, the force perpendicular to that to the rod is mg cosine theta and we have a force along the rod which is mg sine theta that's all fairly standard hopefully you're familiar with that looking at a if we know the the ladder is on the point of slipping so slipping would be movement this way then that is a clue about the direction of movement of the frictional force because the frictional force is opposite the, to the direction of movement. So if it's about to slip, then friction would be this way towards the wall. We will have a force pushing against the ladder from the wall out this way. Let's call that F. We would have components of that perpendicular to the rod. And we also know the length is 2a, so that's all the way along the rod. Now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to essentially solve for mu or find an expression for mu. So that's going to involve finding the frictional force as well as the normal force because the frictional force, uh, let's call that, um, I've already used F, so F, F for frictional force. This is mu times the normal force. So what I'm looking for here is the frictional force and then I'm going to try to rearrange for mu. To do this, I want to take the moments around a point on this rod. Now I'm going to choose B because if I choose A, then the forces acting at A, they are set to zero because they're zero distance away from that point. So because I want this frictional force to be part of the equation, I'm going to take the moments around B. So then this is going to be my point of rotation. And because the ladder's in equilibrium, all of the forces along the rod, when we take the moments at B, they should equal zero. When we're taking moments around a point, we need the perpendicular component of that force. So for the frictional force, we're gonna have some 
perpendicular component and uh, I'm not sure why I used F here. Usually I use F for the frictional force. Anyways, let's call this FF. This is going to be multiplied by sine theta. Uh, just quickly because we can take a right angle triangle here. This would be theta. So this is the opposite side. So it's the hypotenuse times sine theta. That's the perpendicular aspect of the frictional force. And another force we need to consider here is the force pushing up from the ground. So basically the normal force pushing up against the ladder, let's call that R, and the perpendicular aspect of that would be R cosine theta, because this would be theta here and that's the adjacent side. Okay, so we have all of the perpendicular aspects of the forces. If we take the moments around B, we need to multiply them by the distance from B. So this one's going to be multiplied by 2A. Same with the frictional force and then the weight force is going to be multiplied by A. And setting those equal to each other, so these two here are going to equal the normal force at B so that it's in equilibrium. Okay, so that's going to be the first equation we can start off with for part A. So moments around B, we have got the weight force multiplied by A plus the frictional force multiplied by 2A. And this is equal to the normal force multiplied by 2A as well. Uh, also, I'm going to use a different expression for the frictional force here. I've written N here. I'm not sure I wrote N. I should have used R because I'm using R down here. So the frictional force is mu r, so I'm going to use that expression in here as well and also rearrange this a little bit. So I'm going to subtract from the right hand side. So then I would have mu r times sine of theta times 2a equal to r cosine theta times 2a. Subtract mg cosine theta times a because what I'm trying to do here is to solve for mu. So I'm trying to get rid of everything on the left hand side except mu. Next I could divide through by a, so I'd have mu r sine theta times two equal to r cosine theta times two take mg cosine theta. Then there's another tricky step here. So looking back at the diagram, if we were to resolve vertically, the only vertical forces acting on this ladder are the weight force, mg, and the normal force pushing back from the ground. Those two, because it's again, it's in equilibrium, they need to be equal. So we can actually say the normal force is equal to mg here. So the next bit we can say is to resolve vertically and say that r equals mg. So plugging that in here, we would have r instead of mg. And then if we divided through by r, we've got an r on the left and r's in both terms on the right hand side. Divide through by r, we get rid of those. So then we'd just be left with mu sine theta times 2 equal to uh, 2 cosine theta subtract cosine theta. Remember that mg became r and that disappeared. So then 2 cosine theta subtract cosine theta is just cosine theta. So we have mu sine theta times two equal to cosine theta. Um, I run out of room, I should have done it on the next page. Divide by two sine theta, we'd have mu equal to cosine theta divided by two sine theta. Cosine over sine theta is one over 10 theta, right? because 10 theta equals sine over cosine. If you inverse that, you get cosine over sine. So this can be written as one over two ten theta. Okay, so there we go. We've shown that mu is equal to one over two ten theta. I have not used that much working out here, but I feel like there's a lot of work involved in these few lines. Recognizing all of those forces and then also resolving vertically and some tricky algebra as well. Quite a bit of work involved there. Okay, so part B says, if the ladder were not modeled as uniform state, how this would affect the calculated value of mu, explaining your answer carefully. So if the ladder is not modeled as uniform, 
then that could mean that the center of mass is closer or further away from B. So if it's not uniform, the center of mass could be up here or it could be down here. So the center of mass moves along that rod, depending on the weight distribution of the rod. So I'm going to go back to my initial equations of part A and see how that affects it. So what would happen? What is affected in this equation? It's this part here, this weight component of this equation of moments around B. What changes in this? It's this distance here, the distance away from B. So at the moment, because it's in the center, the distance away from B is A. If it moved along the rod, maybe it moved closer to B, then this would be smaller. So maybe this would be half A, right? So half A is the distance from B. How would that affect what happens in this equation? Well, if you follow the algebra, follow the working out, over here we'd have half A, then half mg cosine multiplied by half because we got rid of the a's and then once you follow follow it all through you get to this point and you notice we'd have a coefficient of cosine theta here of a half so rather than two cosine theta take cosine theta we'd have two cosine theta take half cosine theta that means that here then we would have three on two cosine theta or one and a half cosine theta so once you work all of that out, you realize that if it was closer to B, we'd have a larger coefficient of cosine theta. If it was further away from B, so maybe this would be 3 on 2A, 3 on 2A or something, then we'd have a smaller coefficient of cosine theta here. What does that mean? It means that mu is directly proportional to the distance from the center of the mass to B. So if that distance gets smaller, mu gets smaller. If that distance gets further away, mu gets uh, larger. Okay, so I'm going to try to summarize some of that for part B. So if the ladder is not modeled as uniform, then, so the center of mass might change. It could be closer to A or B. Um, and we also know that mu is directly proportional, uh, directly proportional to the distance from the center of mass to B. And as that center of mass moved along the rod, mu would increase or decrease in relation to that. Okay, so that's my answer to part B. Um, and I came up with this relationship from uh, following the working out from part A. That was question two for a total of nine marks. Question three says, in this question, position vectors are given relative to a fixed origin O. So this is a vector question. Don't know about you, but I much prefer these to the latter questions. Anyways, the question says, particle P moves under the action of a single force F newtons. At time T seconds where T is greater than or equal to zero, the position vector of P R meters is given by R equal to T squared take 5 T I plus 5 T squared plus 6 T J. The mass of P is 0.5 kilograms. At time T seconds, P is moving in the direction of the vector I plus 2 J. Find the value of T. All right, let's take some notes down below firstly. So for part A, we know the mass equals 0.5 kilograms. We know the position is given by T squared take 5Ti plus 5T squared plus 6Tj. And it says at T seconds, P is moving in the direction of the vector I plus 2J. Now, what does that mean if it's moving in that direction? Well, when you're given velocity, velocity has a direction. So if something is moving in the direction of this vector, it's going to have a velocity of some multiple of that because the velocity vector will be in the same direction as that. So it's going to have a velocity of something multiplied by I plus 2J. So it doesn't say velocity anywhere in this question, but this bit of information here is hinting at velocity. So we have a position vector. How do you get from position to velocity? You take the derivative. The derivative of the position is the velocity. So we're going to take the derivative of this vector and then relate it to this direction vector. So firstly, the derivative of R with respect to T is what we're gonna focus on first. We can just use the power rule here. So this is going to be 3t squared minus 5i plus 10t 
plus 6j and this is the velocity vector okay so at at time t seconds p is moving in that direction so we need to find t well we could say when t equals t now that might seem a bit redundant but i'm going to go with it anyway so when t equals t the velocity would be some multiple of i plus 2j so what you could do here is set this coefficient 3t squared minus 5 equal to k and this equal to 2k that will allow you to solve for t or you could say that this coefficient is going to be two times this coefficient here and that would give you an equation to solve as well so this is double this so we would have 10t plus 6 equal to 2 multiplied by 3t squared minus 5 and then we have an equation we can solve so firstly expand out the brackets so 10t plus 6 equals 6t squared minus 10 move everything to the right hand side so on the right we'd have 6t squared minus 10t minus 16 equals 0 then divide through by 2 so we'd have 3t squared minus 5t minus 8 equals 0 then let's try to factorize this so factors of 8 multiplied by 3 that make 5 well we could use 8 and 1 1 multiplied by 3 and 8 would make 5 so this should factorize we would have 3t and t and then 1 there and 8 here and this needs to be a negative and a positive so that would give us 3t squared minus 5t minus 8 okay so then we have solutions of uh, t equal to 8 on 3 and t equal to negative 1 but in this case go back to the question it said t is greater than or equal to 0 so therefore we only have one valid solution t equal to 8 on 3 or 2 and 2 thirds so when the particle is at point P just check the question um, sorry particle P at time t t is 8 on 3 or 2 and 2 thirds seconds okay so that was part A so just finish that off okay there we go that's my final answer there um, also I should say as t is greater than or equal to 0 we can't use that solution okay so that was part A part B says find the magnitude of f when t equals 2 usually what we need for f is the mass and the acceleration because f equals ma in this case we have the mass we don't have the acceleration yet but following the same or similar logic to part a we can find the derivative of the velocity the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration so we had an expression for the velocity it was this 3t squared minus 5 10t plus 6 so let's go ahead and write that down so we can take the derivative of this and that will give us the acceleration again just using the power rule this will be 6t i plus 10 j and this is acceleration okay and we are looking for the force when t equals 2 so when t equals 2 a will equal uh, plugging that into this expression we'd have 12i plus 10j meters per second squared from here we could find the magnitude of a or use f equals ma already i might do the magnitude of a first so this would be the square root of 12 squared plus 10 squared this is the square root of 144 plus 100 244 so let's put that into a calculator and we get 15.62 etc then using f equals ma we know m this would be 0.5 times this which if we put that into a calculator 0.5 times our previous answer we get 7.81 etc 
And did it say to round off? No, it didn't say to round off to anything. But we could round this off to two decimal places, maybe. So this rounds off to 7.81 newtons there for part B. Okay, that was question three of this mechanics section for nine marks. Question four says, in this question, the unit vectors I and J are in a vertical plane, I being horizontal and J being vertically upward. And it gives us a diagram and it says, a small ball is projected from the fixed point O on horizontal ground with velocity 9I plus 12J meters per second. The ball passes through the point A, which is H meters vertically above the level of O as shown in figure two. The velocity of the ball at the instant it passes through the point A is lambda I minus J where lambda is a positive constant. The ball is modeled as a particle moving freely under gravity. Find the value of h. Right, so it starts off with this velocity vector 9i plus 12j, goes up and down as you'd expect, and then over at a here, it's at a height of h meters, and then it has a velocity of lambda i minus j. Looking at this vector here, nine is the horizontal component, 12 is the vertical component. They even tell you that up here. The horizontal component of this velocity doesn't change. There's no force acting on this ball horizontally because we're not taking any kind of air resistance or wind into account. So the horizontal velocity is not being affected at all. So that means at point A, the horizontal aspect of the velocity will still be nine. So in that case, if both of these coefficients are the same, in other words, they're both lambda, essentially, then therefore the vertical component of this velocity now must equal nine as well. So that's what that information there is telling us. So the horizontal and vertical velocity at point A are both nine meters per second. And that's really the key piece of information that's going to allow us to solve this question. So for part A, that's the first thing I'm going to state. So uh, lambda equals nine as the horizontal component does not change. So the main point being, if we're looking for the height here, we're essentially looking for the distance this ball has traveled vertically or the displacement, the vertical displacement. So if we have the vertical velocity or how much that's changed, then we'll be able to find the displacement. And there are a couple ways to do this. You could use V equals U plus AT and find the time, or you could use v squared equals u squared plus 2as. That's what I'm going to go ahead and do. So the first thing I'm going to write down is uh, v equals nine meters per second at a, and our initial vertical velocity, I might call that uy, that was 12 meters per second coming from this vector here. That was the vertical component. Okay, so we have the initial velocity, we have the current velocity. If we use V squared equals U squared plus two AS, it's probably the most efficient way to do this, but you'd still get the correct answer if you did it differently. The acceleration is going to be gravity, gravitational acceleration. So plugging these in, V is nine, U is 12, I'm sorry, that's squared plus two times 9.8 times S, we're going to be able to solve for S. So let's just square these first. This will be 81 equals 144 plus 19.6 S. And actually you could say this is negative because the gravitational acceleration is negative in the opposite direction of movement or the velocity. So I guess we could change that to a negative and then we get 81 take 144 divided by negative 19.6. See what we get. So we did 81 subtract 144 divided by negative 19.6. And we get 3.214, etc. cetera. Um, so we can say S is equal to 3.214. And this rounds off to 3.21. And that was H. So this is H. And that was in meters, I believe. Yes, that was in meters. And again, didn't say to round off to anything. So um, actually, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. It looks a bit silly. So let's call this H. 
and 3.21 meters. Okay, that was part A. Part B says state the minimum speed of the ball as it moves from O to A. Let's go back to the diagram. Now, any time that any point along this diagram, there's going to be some vertical aspect of this velocity, except at one point in this arc. So where would that one point be where there's no vertical velocity? That would be at the very vertex at the top of the curve. At that point, there's only horizontal velocity. At every other point, there's going to be a bit more velocity because it's also moving down or up. So it would be greater than nine. At this point, that would be the minimum of nine meters per second. So to answer the question, the minimum speed would be at the top of the curve, which would be nine meters per second. So for part B, answer is nine meters per second. It just said state the minimum. Part C says find the length of time for which the speed of the ball is less than 12 meters per second. For part C, again, the horizontal velocity is not changing. The vertical velocity is what we're going to have to figure out. And then hopefully we can work out time from that. So I'm going to firstly set up an inequality with this velocity as our maximum. So let's get started on part C. The magnitude of the velocity of the modulus would be the square root of the horizontal component nine plus the vertical component, which we are trying to find the boundaries of. So it would be nine squared plus V Y squared. And this needs to be less than 12. 12 is our max velocity. Simplifying this, square both sides, we get 9 squared plus Vy squared less than 144, and then Vy squared less than 144 take 81, 63, and then Vy less than the square root of 63, or even plus or minus the square root of 63. Okay, so these are the boundaries of the velocity. So I guess either side of that loop, so the ball's going like this, I guess it's somewhere over here. So it'd be the positive velocity and the negative going down. Okay, now let's use an equation, one of the SUVAT equations to solve for T. Let's use U plus AT. Hopefully that's not too complicated. And this is equal to plus or minus square root of 63. So we're looking for the time at each of these points. We know the initial vertical velocity. We know the acceleration. So to find the time that has passed to each of these points here, we can solve this equation with the vertical velocity because we know the vertical velocity at those points. So let's go ahead and plug these in. Initial vertical velocity was 12, 9.8 for the acceleration and let's see what we get here for t again that's a negative acceleration so we're going to do t equal to positive root 63 take 12 divided by negative 9.8 for my first one so square root of 63 take 12 divided by negative 9.8 and i get 0.414 and so on. And my next one is going to be negative root 63, take 12 divided by negative 9.8, and I get 2.0344, etc. Okay, there are my times to each of those points. So after 0.4 seconds, the velocity then is dropping below 12 meters per second. Then all the way through this interval, it's less than 12 and once it gets to this point again it's increasing to above 12 again after that so in this section here that's when the speed or the velocity is less than 12 meters per second so i need to find the difference between these to get that time so i'll say therefore so the time at less than 12 meters per second is the difference between these let's figure out what that is so we'll take that and subtract our previous answer so uh, I'll just type it in and I get an answer of 1.6198 
and I might round that off to 1.62, 1.62 seconds to two decimal places. All right, that was part C. Okay, on to part D. Part D says the model could be refined by considering air resistance. Suggest one other refinement to the model that would make it more realistic. So one other refinement, there's quite a few choices here. Uh, we could think of wind, for example, or the spin of the ball. So the spin affects how the ball travels through the air or the um, the size of the ball, like if it's a massive beach ball, that's going to affect how it flies through the air. So e any one of those I think would be fine. I'm just going to say the spin of the ball. So part D. That was question four for a total of 10 marks. Question five gives us a diagram and it says two packages A and B, each of mass three kilograms are attached to the ends of a rope. Initially, A is held at rest on a smooth fixed plane that is inclined at angle theta to the horizontal ground where sine theta equals 2 over 7. The rope passes over a pulley P fixed at the top of the plane. The pulley is modelled as small and smooth. The part of the string from A to P is parallel to a line of greatest slope of the plane. Package B hangs freely below P as shown in figure 3. The packages are released from rest with the string taut and A moves up the plane. In this model, the packages are modelled as particles and the rope as a light inextensible string. The magnitude of the tension in the string immediately after the packages are released is T newtons. Find the value of T. Let's firstly have a close look at this diagram and think of some of the forces acting on these packages. And also let's look closely at some of the information in the question. So firstly, we have the mass of each one or, or the weight force pulling down. For package B, this would be straight down towards the ground. This would be mg. And then we have the tension force in the rope pulling up. For A, we have the weight force. And we have to think of the perpendicular and parallel components of that. So this would be mg cosine theta. And this one here would be mg sine theta. And then we have the tension force in the rope as well. We don't have to think about friction because they've said this is a smooth fixed plane. That means no friction. Similarly with the pulley, they've said it's small and smooth. Smooth meaning again, no friction. They've told us that sine theta equals two over seven. That will be useful for our solution. And they've also told us that the packages are released from rest and the string is taut, meaning that it's a tight string so that the tension forces at these two points will be the same. Also because the rope is a light inextensible string, so we don't have any weight to consider in the rope. And then they also tell us A moves up the plane. So B is going to be moving down, A is going to be moving up. And when they're released, they'll be moving at the same rate because they're joined by this taut string. So there's no way they could be moving at different rates. They're joined together. So both packages will be moving at the same rate and that's going to be the key to our solution here. So for part A, what we're going to be doing is resolving the forces on these packages. For A, we'll be resolving them horizontally, in other words, parallel to its movement. For B, we'll be resolving them vertically because it's moving down and the string is pulling up. So that's how we're going to solve this. And we're going to say that they're moving at the same rate. They have the same mass. So therefore, they'll have the same force working on both because as you know, F equals MA, those two things being equal, F will be equal. So that's how we're going to be solving part A here. So let's firstly consider package A and resolve horizontally, taking their direction of movement as positive. So then the tension force is positive and that parallel force of the weight is negative. So subtract mg sine theta. And this must be equal to the net force acting on that package, which we know must be the mass times its acceleration. So we know the mass is three and let's call the acceleration A. We don't actually know what that is, but it will be the same as package B. Uh, also, I could have written three in there for the mass. So this will be three here. 
okay? We also know sine of theta from the question is two over seven. So we can simplify this a little bit. This will be T subtract three. Actually, let's simplify even further. So sine of theta is two over seven. Two times three is six. So this would be six G on seven equals three A. And that's my first equation that I'm going to create here for package A. Next, let's consider B. And for B, we'll be resolving vertically and we'll take its direction of movement as positive. So in this case, its weight force will be positive. So 3G and the tension force from the rope will be negative. So take T and this is equal to the net force acting on that package which is MA, so mass times the same acceleration as A up here. So we can use A again for acceleration. We don't have to introduce a different variable for that. This is my second equation. And hopefully you notice something now. We have T minus 6G on seven equal to 3A and 3G take T equal to 3A. We can now set these two equations equal to each other, and then we'll be able to solve for T. So T takes 6G on seven equals 3G take T. Add that T to the left-hand side, add 6G on seven to the right-hand side, we would have 2T equal to, well, let's just write this out and then we'll simplify further. So then this becomes 21G on seven plus 6G on seven, so 27G on seven. So 2t equals 27g on seven. Then divide by two or multiply seven by two there, t is going to equal 27g on 14. That's my final answer for part A. Part B says at the instant when the packages are released from rest, B is 0.8 meters above the ground and A is at the point C on the plane. When B reaches the ground, B is immediately brought to rest by the impact with the ground. In the subsequent motion, A does not reach P and comes to instantaneous rest at the point D on the plane. Find the distance CD. Let's take a quick look at the diagram again. So they've marked in that point eight meters for B and they've told us A does not reach P. So A does not reach the pulley. It comes to rest at some point D on the plane here. And it starts at C, that's what they tell us. So A was at the point C and then it comes to rest at the point D or instantaneous rest. So we're looking for this distance from where the package is now to D. So, so what's actually happening here? Well, B has fallen 0.8 meters, hit the ground, and A is going to continue moving up that plane after B stops moving. So A is going to have some momentum that pulls it up the plane a bit further than B has traveled and then it comes to rest at D. So we need to be able to figure out how, how much further A has traveled, and we can do that by figuring out the velocity in the system when B stops moving. So how fast is A moving up the plane? We can also figure out the acceleration acting on A, and once we have the velocity and the acceleration, we can work out displacement. So that's going to be my approach for part B. So starting off for part B, I'm going to firstly find the acceleration using my working from part A. So I know that 3A equals T take 6G on seven. Actually, it might be easier to use this equation here. So I know 3A equals 3G take T, and now I have a solution for T. So using this equation here, I can come up with an expression for A. So 3A, equals 3G subtract T, so subtract 27G on 14. And this is from part A. So let's go ahead and solve this for A now. Three times 14 is 42. 42G take 27G on 14 is the right hand side. 42 take 27 is 15G on 14. And then uh, this will be multiplied by one and three. And then 15 divided by three is five. So this would be five G on 14. 
for a meters per second squared and we could also give a decimal value to that using 9.8 for g so this would be 5 times 9.8 divided by 14 3.5 meters per second squared for a so now we know the acceleration acting on package A when it's released and that's the net acceleration right because this was the net force 3A was the net force so that's taking into account kind of automatically the force pulling down on the package as well so that acceleration is when it's released it started from a velocity of zero because they were at rest so we have the initial velocity we have the initial acceleration now we can use this formula v squared equals u squared plus 2as and this is going to tell us the velocity after package b hits the ground so after it's moved 0.8 meters so the displacement in this formula is going to be 0.8 as i said initial velocity is zero so v squared is going to equal 2 times the acceleration 3.5 times the displacement 0.8 and this will be, let's put that into a calculator, 7 times 0.8, 5.6 for v squared. So I could work out the actual value of v, but I'm not going to because I'm actually going to use this formula again. But I want to go back to the uh, diagram again just to point out what I'm actually doing. So once package B hits the ground, package A is still moving up the plane. And I've worked out now the velocity it has after package B hits the ground. So there's no longer that force from the rope pulling the package up. There's no longer a tension force, it just has its momentum. So it has an initial velocity, but now the only force acting on the package is this parallel force of the weight force pulling the package down. And the only acceleration acting on package A is G sine theta. So we have this initial 0.8 meters where the package was being pulled by package B. Now it's being pulled to a stop by this acceleration, the parallel acceleration from the weight. So now we can go back to our working out and again use this formula for package A, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. The initial velocity in this equation, U squared, is going to be our answer from our previous working out. That's the speed that we're starting from here. V squared, the final velocity is zero because the package comes to rest at D. So this is going to be zero equals to U squared. We've already got an expression for U squared. It was 5.6, so we don't have to you know, square this. It was already squared, so this will be 5.6. 2A, the acceleration, as I said, was G sine theta. Sine theta, we have an expression for that, was 2 over 7. So A, in this case, will be 2 over 7G. And this is in the opposite direction of movement, so this will be a negative 2 multiplied by 2 over 7 times G. And S is what we're looking for, that displacement, how far it's moved. So just to be really clear, this was our initial velocity. In this case, V squared was 0, as I said. Then let's go ahead and solve this for s. So add this to the other side, we would have 4 over 7g times s equal to 5.6. Multiply this by 7, divide by 4. So 5.6 times 7, divide by 4, we get 9.8 and then divide by g. This is going to be 9.8 divided by 9.8, so s is going to be 1 meters. Are we talking about meters? Yes. So then displacement from once package B hits the ground to point D is one meter. So we need to add on that initial 0.8 meters that it's already traveled. Therefore, CD is going to equal 1.8 meters for my final answer there. All right, I'm going to go back to the diagram again, just to be really clear about what's going on. If you want to skip this bit, that's fine. So we had package B fall to the ground, hit the ground, pulled that package to this point here. We didn't give that a label. Then it moved this additional distance without any force from the string. It just had existing momentum. It had an initial velocity from this point, And 
we found that to be, or V squared was 5.6. The force then was acting in the opposite direction. We found that displacement to be one meter from this point to D. So this distance here was one meter. It had already moved an existing 0.8 meters. So the total distance from C to D was 1.8 meters. Okay, tricky question. On to the next one. Part C, state two limitations of the model that could affect the reliability of your answers. Okay, I'm going to go with the safe bet, air resistance. Air resistance is usually a fairly safe bet with these types of questions because usually you ignore it. So that's a limitation. Ignoring air resistance is a limitation. And another one could be the string. We're also assuming it's a light, inextensible string. In other words, it doesn't stretch and there's no weight to it. But in the real world, we need to assume there's weight to a string and we need to assume it stretches a bit. So that's a limitation. If you are looking at air resistance, you'd also have to consider the size of the packages and the pulley. We're assuming there's no friction around the pulley. So um, any two of those, I guess. So air resistance and the string would be my two there. So for part C, no air resistance and non-extensible string are the assumptions we made. All right, that is the final question in this paper. Uh, that was question five of the mechanics section for a total of 13 marks. I hope you found that useful. Please leave a like. If you did subscribe, if you wanna see more content, sound off in the comments with any suggestions, any improvements, any different solutions, things like that. Always love to hear from you. I hope your revision's going well. If you're after more A-level walkthroughs, this is the third set of papers I've completed. So check out the other playlists in my playlists section for A-level papers if you want more revision. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.